Good morning. Welcome to the House of the Lord this Sunday morning. Uh, just a reminder, the upcoming weeks, next Sunday, of course, we'll be back here at 9 o'clock for our, our worship service. Uh, on the 13th, however, our worship service will take place at Everett Park, and we ask that you please bring your lawn chairs, um, and there'll be a brunch that will be served after that service. Um, people are invited to bring their pontoons and boats up if they want to hear the message or hear the service from the shoreline, they can do so. But just a reminder, please uh, bring your own lawn chairs that day, and then people can space out the way that they feel comfortable. As we gather here in worship today, in the quiet refuge of this sanctuary, it may be easy to forget that we live in a world that has been marred by sin, cursed by death, and filled with wickedness. Although we confront it every day, this very present evil will not overcome us. God's desire is for us to be saved and delivered by his son, Jesus, so that we are enabled to love, to live, and to overcome evil with good. In our worship service today, we receive the same Jesus who once overcame evil by carrying his cross to suffer for our salvation, trouncing over all the evil we will ever face. Our risen Savior lives to love, to bless, and to deliver us as his people. We begin by singing our opening hymn, With the Lord We Begin Your Task. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins, and cleanse us from all our righteousness. Let us therefore come before his throne of grace with humble and sincere hearts, to lay our burdens down. Gracious Lord, we come before you, laying the burden of our sin at the foot of your cross. We openly acknowledge our failure to follow your plans for our lives. 
We have stumbled and fallen in our service to you. We have placed our agenda ahead of yours. We've been shallow in our love towards you and towards those you have placed in our path. We cry out for mercy, trusting in your promise to forgive us through the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God indeed has heard your cry for mercy and fulfills his promise to save and deliver you. Lavishing his grace upon you in Jesus, he enables you to love and forgive as he first loved and forgiven you. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Delight yourself in the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. We join now in singing our hymn of praise, Praise to You and Adoration. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption. Grant us courage to take up our cross daily and follow him wherever he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this day is taken from the prophecy of Jeremiah, the 15th chapter, beginning with 15th verse. You know, being a prophet, being a messenger for the Lord is not always an easy task, or is it a popular task? We hear Jeremiah pleading on behalf of himself before God, 
because God has placed upon him the burden of carrying a message to the children of Israel. And it's not a pleasant message. It's a message of law and condemnation. We're living in those times as well. We see our country in strife and, and uh, dealing with all kinds of matters. I don't care if it's racial or economic or what it was that it separates us from, from each other. But, you know, Jeremiah, and as Jeff is going to share with us in his message, the Lord said there's three qualifications to be a disciple. Deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. You know, Jeremiah, uh, in 570 B.C., was stoned by his own people. The people that he brought, the message of God's redeeming grace, was stoned to death. Isaiah, often we hear from the prophet of Isaiah, he died by being sawed in half by a message that he declared before God and was asked to deliver to the people. And life is not easy as a Christian, and we need to be mindful of that. God didn't promise us roses. And sometimes our lives are rather thorny. And sometimes, you know what, folks, we need to owe up and, and, and to have that courage and to pray about it and to stand up for what is right and what is wrong. We have what, what is right and wrong. It's written in the Bible, God's word. Hear now the message that God shared with Isaiah. You understand, O Lord, remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering, do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me, and you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending? And my wound grievous and incurable. Will you be to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you'll be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you to rescue you and save you, declares the Lord. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the cruel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the words of the graduate we read together. Fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him lack nothing. In our epistle reading today, St. Paul talks about what genuine love is. A love that overcomes evil. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position, and do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please now rise to the Alleluia verse. 
Alleluia. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Alleluia. Our Holy Gospel this morning is brought, is, comes from the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. In our reading this morning, Jesus is calling upon his disciples to take up their cross, to deny themselves, and to follow him. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but instead the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Tell you the truth, some are, who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you. Please join me in the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, and I ask that you please rise on the third verse.
We noticed we were having a few problems with my microphone, so I'm going to be using the handheld. I'll see if I can figure out what it is during the week. Our gospel reading this morning we had from chapter 16 of the uh, Gospel of Matthew. It t- mentioned in there about Jesus saying to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and come up and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. You may be seated. In our reading this morning, Jesus is foretelling the disciples of his upcoming death on the cross. It's the first time we hear about it in the Gospel of Matthew. And right away, of course, Peter denies that this is going to happen. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but instead the things of men. So because this is the first time we hear in the Gospel of Matthew about Jesus' fulfillment of God's plan in his death on the cross, And in making this statement to his disciples, he's beginning to change the focus of spreading God's word in Israel to preaching to God's church. And he's also asking his disciples to drop all of their worldly intentions to take up the cross and to follow him. And they paid a price for doing just that. These disciples left behind their fishing nets, they left behind their families, and they left all that they had so they could follow Jesus. Now we as Christians know that in order to be strong in our faith, We have to encounter times that may be a little bit challenging for us. We may be ridiculed for our belief by others. And at other times, we may even be challenged by those who don't believe to prove our faith or to call upon Jesus to defend us. That's going to happen with us as being Christians. At some point in your life, you'll encounter something like that. Now, do you remember the young man who stood face to face with a Native American uh, elder? It was near the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. This took place back in January of 2019. His name was Nicholas Sandman, and then he was in an event that was a large confrontation between groups of political demonstrators. Now, Nicholas was among a group of students that was from Covington Catholic High School in Park Hills, Kentucky. They were at that location that day because they were taking part in a pro-life march for a pro-life march for life rally. Now Nicholas was approached by Nathan Phillips, and Nathan Phillips was a Native American activist who was at that same location that day as part of the Indigenous Peoples March. Now since the media was there to capture all, both events, that focus for some reason quickly switched to a confrontation that took place between that Native American activist and Nicholas. When the, what the cameras actually captured was the activist very close to Nicholas, basically right by his face, and shouting things at him. But all that Nicholas did was he had his hands behind his back and he smiled the entire time, never saying a word. What happened was a lot of the videos and the photos that you saw after that point and the news stories that you heard after that were released. It portrayed the Catholic students as the aggressors and even the New York Times described it as an explosive convergence of race, religion, and ideological beliefs. So, of course, outrage rose among the general public after these news reports broke, and those students in the school were receiving death threats and threats of violence. Only days later, after those videos were released, it showed the initial media reactions had misrepresented and omitted critical details of that incident, especially what led up to that point. And in doing so, defamation lawsuits were filed against these news uh, news, uh, media outlets, and it was uh, undisclosed settlements were received Uh, from Nicholas himself, from CNN, and also the Washington Post. Now, it took a lot of willpower and courage for Nicholas to stand there and just take what was when somebody's yelling right at your face, not saying a word, and just smiling. How many of you, if you had that same thing happen to you, would be able to do the same thing? I know it would be very challenging for me when you have somebody in your face challenging you. Uh, I don't know what all was said, but basically it would be a challenge to our, our beliefs that what we have. It would be very tough to be able to just not say anything and just smile. Now, Christians throughout the years have faced many struggles for their faith, and in more recent years, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, here at St. John's, in this surrounding area, and all over the world, we're facing even more and more challenges for our beliefs. And we hear of groups challenging the right of having Christian symbols held or placed in public places, or sayings of Christian sayings themselves being in public places. In fact, just this week I became aware of a uh, Baptist church in California. They were fined $10,000 by the state of California. Why? 
they held indoor church worship services, after, and it was after an order was placed that they could not meet in, indoors, that they would have to meet outdoors with a maximum of 60 people. This church had over 1,000 active attendees every Sunday in church. They were being told they had to meet outside and have only 60 people. Well, they continued holding services, and at that point, a five-page cease and desist order was taped to their front door by the state of California. It threatened even more fines, and if they didn't stop holding services and singing during their worship, they would have even more challenges ahead of them. The, uh, the uh, case is still being disputed on by both sides at this point. We're faced with even more troubling things in recent years, in recent months especially. There's a group of people right now that think that it's okay to allow the abortion of a child even after it's born. Jesus teaches us that we need to respect and protect, or protect all living creation, and that includes the unborn and the born. Yet another group says that we should not condemn pedophiles because pedophilia is actually should be considered a sexual orientation. Now, how can anyone justly justify this criminal act and say that it should be allowed because they think that it's a sexual orientation? What's happening in this world? As fellow believers in Christ, we all are challenged by our beliefs at some point in our life. Those challenges usually lead to judgments being made. and Sometimes those judgments will come from our own fellow believers. But that's something that we as earthly beings act upon without allowing our teachings of God's word to help us think about what's happening clearly and also to respond accordingly. A recent Christian-based report stated that due to this recent epidemic of the virus, up to 20% of the churches in this country could be closing their doors for good in the near future. 20%. Now much of this is based upon the fact that even churches have seen a huge decline in worship attendance and even sharper decline in regular church giving since this whole virus event took place. It's too easy to find excuses not to worship in the house of the Lord, or we're allowing other influences to make decisions for us on whether to either attend worship or to give to our church on a regular basis. We as Christians need to stand up for our religious rights, return to the houses of worship, and contribute both financially and spiritually to turn the tide of our society's woes and to renew our faith in God and to trust in him to protect and also to heal us. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus told his disciples to deny themselves, to leave behind their earthly wants, and to follow him. I believe that he is in the same way calling out to us, each one of us as Christians, to take up that cross, to leave the earthly distractions aside and the influences of our societies aside. In making this request, Jesus isn't saying, do as I say and not as I do. He himself, Jesus himself, denied himself by fulfilling the promise of being nailed to the cross and dying to save us from our own sins. Thanks be to God that he did that for us. He could have very easily have said that the sacrifice was too great and that he would not do it. His disciples and followers wanted to make him a king. They wanted to lift him up high and adorn him with both praise and earthly gifts. But Jesus knew that he had to deny himself and make that long and painful journey, which ended up with him hanging high on a cross on Mount Calvary to save all of those who believe in Christ from eternal damnation. Fellow members at St. John's and those who are watching at home, we're gathering here today in God's house, and we do so not only to hear the words of the Lord, we do so also because we need to have each other's support through the one true body of Christ, both physically and spiritually. Many Many, many of us are growing increasingly distressed and frustrated with the events of the world, the influences that we're having put upon us of various uh, things, and also what's taking place around us. We're seeing many challenges to our faith, our belief in God and his word, and the many morals that were instilled in us from the day that we were born. Sorry to say that these worldly acts and events are leading many of us to judge one another by how we act or how we respond to these events. These judgments are being fueled by the devil, and they're also, it's also by our earthly desires to focus on me only. That's what society tells us right now. It's the me generation. Think about me. That's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to not deny what society tells us, to, 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 which is uh, to be the all about me generation. He instead wants us to be strong and hold strong to our beliefs and to live our lives according to his word. Is it always going to be easy to do that, holding on to our beliefs and remaining strong in our word? Not always. 
As long as we're, uh, the devil himself is around to keep placing doubt, fear, distrust, anger, judgment, and even denial into our lives, we'll always have the outside influencing us, pushing us away from the church. The church itself, many things are changing in our society today. And it's been changing for a long time, and it'll continue to change. But there's one thing that stays constant, and that's God's word. And, our pro- and his promise to us that we'll have eternal life in him. And all we have to do is believe in him and live by his word. We need to experience a spiritual revival in our church and in our own lives. It may not be a popular thing for you to do, and you may experience some ridicule or even anger from some of those that are around you. But God teaches us that we have to deny what society says to be the way it should be, that we should act and both live. Instead, follow and focus on what Jesus says and to live according to what his word teaches us through the Bible and in worship. And we'll need to have his protection and guidance, but we will have eternal life with him in his kingdom in the end. In Matthew 16, verse 25, Jesus said, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. God's calling upon us to take up the cross, to deny ourselves, and to follow him. Are you willing to do that? May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds focused on Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with our next hymn. Please rise for prayer. Knowing the will of God that all would come to the knowledge of your Son and find salvation in Christ, let us pray on behalf of our parish community and for all people according to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, for our faith and faithfulness, especially for those persecuted for the cause of Christ, and for our strength in time of trial, and for us to persevere in grace in the day of trouble. Lord, in your mercy. For our president, for all governors, for all mayors, for all legislators, all civil servants, for those who protect us, we pray, O Lord, as we commend them into your care, we pray that through all of this, that you would work peace among the nations. Lord, in your mercy. 
for favorable weather and for those who tend the soil and harvest its fruits, for business and industry, service workers and artisans, for generosity toward those in need, and for the unemployed and underemployed, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, for grace to take up the cross and follow the Lord wherever he leads, for courage in the face of challenge and adversity, and for compassion and harmony in our life together, Lord, in your mercy. For our remembrance of the saints and grace to follow their example of faith, for God to grant us a place with them in their fellowship, and for our eternal life in God's kingdom without end. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy this day at your invitation. Our Lord said we could ask anything in his name. And our Heavenly Father hears our prayers for Jesus' sake and also according to those who have need. We pray this day for Serena Johnson, Marlene Kuntz, Tom Westcott, Bob Blazik, Nathan Beatty, Andrea Mileham, Cindy Chrisinger, Lori Korselman, Julie Krogman, Donna Naraki, Paul Overgaard, Elsie Swanson, Shelley Callahan, Gary Madej, Jenny Anderson, Georgia Holtz, Larry Norm, Lacey McNichol, Roger Spiegler, Cindy Johnson, Gloria Mashoff, Robert Zemer, Kay Groth, Perry Caven, and Har Baird. All of those who are coping and dealing with cancer, receiving treatments under the care of doctors for this disease. We commend them first to the Lord and to those who take care of them. Lord, in your mercy. We pray this day for Mary, Col Mary Kay Schultz. Uh, Mary is back at home after a long stay in the hospital. We give thanks to God for hearing our prayers on her behalf, and she is very thankful to be home. We pray this day for Bruce Bainey as he continues to recover from his infirmities, as he is recovering at home surrounded by loved ones. We lift up in our prayers those on our care list and those that we name in our hearts this day. It's in faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his promises to always be with us that brings us comfort. Lord, in your mercy. We pray this day a prayer of congratulations and thanksgiving on behalf of Tyler and Callie Jo Swanson Franzen, who were united yesterday at this altar in holy marriage. O oh, Heavenly Father, grant that your Holy Spirit may lead those who have pledged their love to one another. May they always know the joy of your great love and dwell within it to the ending of their days. Lord, in your mercy. We pray this day for Ted Kittleson, a neighbor in our community who celebrates today with family and friends his 100th birthday. Grant your continued blessing, O Lord, to your servant, Ted Kittleson, to whom you granted length of days in this present life, that he may know of your loving kindness, abide in the confession of your care and protection, and all things give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, those in Louisiana, those who are dealing and coping with the disaster that's come to shore in Hurricane Laura. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are losing their homes in California due to fires. We lift up our, our neighbors in our country here today. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us in this time of strife and, and separation. We pray, Lord, that people will call upon your name and that you will come and, and bring that love and redemption that you came when you took up the cross for us. Be with all leaders of our country. We pray, Lord, this is a time that will unify us as we come together seeing human need, that human need that can only be answered through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For indeed, he is the answer for the world today. Lord, in your mercy. We join together now in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with and abide with you always. Amen.